So I'm Beth Shoemaker. I'm the Catalog and Resource Access Librarian at St. Ambrose University, which is a, um, in Davenport, Iowa, um, Catholic University. We have about 3,700 students. Um, and I am the only original cataloger in the house. So um, before I begin, he couldn't be here today, but I would like to thank Bobby Boffman for his invaluable help in bringing this paper to fruition. Um, he's the Emerging Technologies Librarian at Minnesota State University in Mankato, for those of you who don't know Bobby. Um, so, starting in library school, we learn that librarianship is a collaborative field. Group projects take pride of place from exams and papers. We work together with others at the core of librarianship, even for catalogers. Um, even though the bulk of what we do day to day is somewhat solitary, um, we couldn't do our job if there weren't such things as um, cooperative cataloging records, consortiums, listservs, Facebook groups, and professional organizations like ALA, Alex, and ACRL. Um, we look to others for feedback, direction, new information, commiseration. Additionally, depending on the size of your institution, you have cataloging colleagues or other kinds of librarians right outside your office door that you can speak to. And these, these networks don't disappear when you have ethical difficulties. Um, in fact, uh, professional ethics are at root group ethics, and librarians are at root collaborators. So no one, we can, we can always fall back on other people's expertise when we have these questions. So the gist of my paper is that no one can whistle a symphony, but if we all work together, we create an orchestra of thoughts and experiences that can define our ethical responses to challenges of our profession. While ALA has a professional code of ethics um, and Alex has a supplement, I'm going to look at those codes to see how they're inadequate. And they don't clarify and guide our cataloging work in any very defined way. I want to discuss two very different attempts at um, making statements about ethics for cataloging. And finally, I'm going to make some recommendations about what a code of ethics for cataloging might involve. Um, what aspects it might encompass, and who I would like to see take up the torch and hammer out a code of ethics for the profession of cataloging. So why a new code altogether? Well, catalogers and other library staff who determine how patrons access resources in the library do fundamentally different work than our um, colleagues who are public facing. So catalogers I'm defining as people who create metadata by describing and classifying resources using controlled vocabulary such as LCSH and standardized guidelines including ACR2 and RDA, among others. And what's clear from the small body of literature about ethics and knowledge organization is that this work is anything but ethically neutral. And we've seen that time and time again over the last day and a half. Um, in our back offices, we have a lot of power. Nobody likes to, you know, this scares other librarians. But um, we have the power to code, to describe, um, and uh, to classify. And the work that we do means that either people find things or they don't find things. Um, we, can, we get to decide who finds what in our library at, at root. Yeah? So this is kind of frightening, and it's a huge responsibility. So this power and the seemingly clandestine nature of what we do, I mean, we've talked about mystification of, of the work that we do in Tina's presentation. Um, justify having our very own code of ethics. So lacking codified ethics, especially for catalogers, reinforces the mystification of the work that we do, and it leaves catalogers without guidelines to inform our work when issues of professional ethics arise, and it leaves us in a lurch for defining our, our ethical responses to problems to our administrators um, and other people in the library. So, Looking at the ALA code, although of course the code in general can be seen to apply to um, library uh, staff and faculty, or staff in, if you're in a public library, um, the ALA code of ethics is really only addressing cataloging very obliquely. Anna Ferris in 2008 points out that the code of ethics has been criticized for, being, for its overly general purview that tries to be all things to all library staff. A closer look at the ALA code leaves catalogers who don't work with the public directly two directly applicable points uh, that I'd like to talk about. Resisting censorship, which is um, up here, and um, separating our personal convictions from our professional duties. Because the specific guidelines are a little bit sparse, I'd like to unpack them just a little bit. 
So item two, you can read in full. We uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. Although ALA doesn't define censorship in this particular um, context, it is defined other places in ALA documents, um, it can take many forms. By choosing cataloging, we take on a really deep responsibility to provide equitable um, and unbiased access to materials. And we've looked at how that's a difficult thing to do for children and for different cultures and um, all sorts of other domains that are not necessarily considered in the tools that we have. Um, while removing resources from circulation is generally not our decision, the method in which we label works holds tremendous power and has, according to um, Olson's Pet the Power's Name, direct practical consequences for users of the library who can be aided or impeded by the arrangement of the catalog. Um, catalogers' ability to, in fact, censor works through biased assignment of controlled vocabulary or classification is much more egregious than the intentional removal of a text from a collection. That decision is generally met by, uh, has criteria, it's met by several um, library staff or faculty, um, but a cataloger can censor work with a few keystrokes or lack thereof. Um, the ALA's labeling and rating system statement admonishes, when labeling is an attempt to prejudice attitudes, it's a censor's tool. Item two calls on catalogers to set aside whatever biases we bring to our desk and consider how to make each item as broadly findable as possible. So item seven clarifies that we distinguish between our personal convictions and our professional duties and do not allow our personal beliefs to interfere with fair representation of the aims of our institutions or provisions of access to the information, their information resources. So ideally, a cataloger works someplace that aligns with their personal um, beliefs and convictions and that minimizes the conflict, but it's not always the case. Uh, I know this working at a Catholic university. Um, so, um, and if those two things are at odds, that causes some problems. Um, Daniel Ken Cassiato in his 2011 case study confronts a situation much like this. Uh, he had a request from his university's trustees to catalog, catalog um, to reclassify books on intelligent design and creationism into the science areas from the religion or theological areas. And despite personal convictions, deep personal convictions, that that is not what one should do, it was the request of his institution and based in part on, um, on point seven of the ALA code, he chose to reclassify those items with, in line with the aims of his institution. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's criticized as trying to be all, all things to all people. So to look for more guidance, we might turn to the elects um, supplement to the code of ethics. Um, you would think that you know this has more to do with people in technical services. I'd like to point out that this that the elect supplement was um, was ratified in 1994 and has not changed since. There have been no updates. So just thinking about all the things that have happened in knowledge for organizations since 1994. Um, so we have even less direction for catalogers um, in this code, and I picked out just a couple of points. Um, two, we strive to provide broad and unbiased access to information. This echoes something that's in the ALA code um, and doesn't really provide any additional information. But we do have number five, which doesn't appear anywhere in the ALA code, that we promote the development and application of standards and professional guidelines. Um, as catalogers, we spend our day checking our um, decisions against professional standards. And this guideline calls upon us to be actively involved in evolving those standards. Um, in order, to, in arguably, in order, to, in order to be faithful to point two, which is to provide the unbiased access. So this could apply to so many things, local library policies for cataloging, critical use of RDA, NACO or SACO contributions, um, <laughs> LCSH, um, of course. Hope Olson, in her, in her 2000 paper, Difference, Culture, and Change, the Untapped Potential of LCSH, reminds us that for librarians and libraries in general to abdicate responsibility for subject access to a universal standard is unethical, and every member of the profession of librarianship shares the responsibility. Again, having talked about um, access to children's materials, for example, um, and, and the um, multiple inadequacies of tools like LCSH. Um, so such uh, rather uh, sparse guidance really hasn't been adequate for all members of the profession. In fact, I would argue that it's probably inadequate for most of the people in this room. Um, 
So, for example, in 2000, Sanford Berman flew in the face of the ALA code and the elect supplement, I think, with um, his credo or mission. And I have to say, even though I think this has um, some definite problems, I really like this. I'll read it. Um, this was published in the Enabash Library, uh, number 116. Cataloging should identify and make accessible a library's resources in all formats. That identification and access should be swift and painless. The language and structure of cataloging entries should be familiar and comprehensible. And catalogers should recognize that they do what they do not to please bosses, not to mindlessly adhere to rules and code protocols, but to serve their information dust colleagues and the public. That's whom they're working for. And we all sort of want to stand up and say, yay, Sandy! Um, but as exciting as that is, um, there are aspects of that that go clearly against accepted um, codes of ethics such as ALA. And we have, as I've stated previously, uh, codes of ethics represent collective ethics, um, not one person. So it does beg the question, is it more ethical to just go along with the code of ethics we have, or is it more ethical to sort of fly in the face of it and question it? That is completely outside the scope of my paper, <laughs> but it does bear um, some thought. So I'd also like to discuss um, Sheila Bear's 2005 paper, Toward a Code of Ethics for Cataloging. She made, um, Bear made a significant and considered effort to author a statement of cataloging ethics. And aside from the fact that without professional endorsement, it's sort of an academic exercise, um, there are some weaknesses in her, um, in her code that I'd like to discuss in the service of perhaps coming up with a more refined code in the future. Um, codes of ethics are, by definition, a little bit idealistic. Um, but code, Bear's code is really lofty and uncompromising, using both tone and language that don't really reflect the situations in which we work. So in general, um, Bear's statements such as, to ensure, we are vigilant, we are honest and truthful, contrast really sharply with language in other codes, for example, ALAs, uphold, protect, distinguish, and strive. Bear's code doesn't seem to admit that we're human beings, and sometimes we're allowed to make errors. With Bear's code, there is no try, there is only do. <laughs> <laughs> the grand language um, also serves to distance us from the realities in which we work. As an example, point two begins, to ensure that users find the information they need, catalogers gather and organize information. Now, her point is that, um, that, we are, that, she, that we create good records in service of that, um, but I would, I would uh, submit that as a cataloger, I can't ensure anyone finds anything. Um, and so that's, again, not reflecting exactly the reality of good work. Um, in point six, she says, we avoid and work to reform cultural biases and standards for subject headings, classification schemes, and name authority control. Well, yes, but we avoid, we have the tools we have. We work to, to improve them, but we have the tools we have. So, um, Many authors, Berman, Olson, Brubaker, and others, have thought about and written and reformed LCSH to try to eliminate biases. And it's most likely going to be a really long process um, to address the obfuscated and patriarchal system that creates LCSH. Um, but I would argue, for example, she might have improved it by um, replacing avoid with recognize. Um, I think that goes a long way to acknowledge the real world cataloging world that we work in and the lack of access and opportunity that many catalogers have to make substantive change in things like LCSH. Um, and I would argue that what can we hope to get from a code of ethics except things that we can apply in our real world situations in our offices. So lastly, I find that Bear's code, um, and again, I, I'd like to stress that I think she did fantastic work. Um, lastly, I find that her code in both language and content fail to acknowledge that many, many catalogers are not degreed librarians. Um, much of the cataloging work is being done by trained staff, and sometimes untrained staff, but <laughs> by people who haven't gone to library school. Um, and any code of ethics that excludes those people is ignoring, again, the reality we work with and the people who are actually doing the work. Um, so take that out of consideration for a minute. Um, so what should a code for for catalogers contain. Both Ferber and RDA do um, give us some direction about what should be included, things like the principle of representation, which Baird did address, um, although not 
uh, concretely in one point. To take the core of Berman's statement, we need to include who we catalog for. Why do we do it? So that you know we can get dot our keys and cross dot our keys and cross our eyes. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully not. Um, <laughs> but um, no, we catalog so that people who come to our library can find the things they need. Um, so the taking the soul of his his idea, um, I think, is important too. Um, we can investigate Homan's thoughts about bad books. Can Cassiato's reclassification quandary, Simonovian's intellectual foundation of information organization, and Olson's power to name, in order to better understand what kind of dilemmas we feel we need guidance for. Um, in addition to real world, out, real, real world application, I assert that any code of ethics for catalogers might contain the relevant points of ALA and the elect supplement in order to create one unified code rather than a hierarchy of codes, which in and of itself could create an ethical dilemma. I have a problem, what do I go to? Um, so the biggest challenge is to figure out what the core of ethics for cataloging is in a constantly changing world of technology and standards and discover how to codify those values in a way that as a group catalogers can agree on. So a professional code of ethics um, for cataloging fulfills several important roles. A code that's accepted by a profession points to consensus within a group about what constitutes ethical behavior and thereby places everyone at the same starting point. A specific code composed and accepted by professional organizations serves to clarify the role of the profession and hopefully um, keep us from being too mis mysterious in our back rooms. Um, and it lends credence to the willingness of its members to act according to its standard. Lastly, it's a tool that can be used to guide and justify decisions and set policy within the library, uh, within cataloging and metadata that can have broad implications for the entire library. Um, I therefore challenge the membership of the cataloging and metadata management section of the, or CAMS of ELEX to convene a working group to address this void and begin drafting a code of ethics for information organization that supports catalogers work as encoders, describers, and classifiers. The ethically complex nature of cataloging the mystification of our hidden work, and the fundamental question of professional cons consensus mandate a code of ethics that all catalogers can invoke. Thank you. Yale code does actually 
answer to your question, yeah. but I do think about the archival code of ethics mm -hmm. from the Society of American Archivists, particularly when I'm talking with donors, because a lot of the work that archivists tend to do is, because we do we get a lot of donations that are always sort of working with people who have archival materials, either within your institution or outside of it. And uh, it's very, sometimes it can be very comforting for people to know that we're not just a group of people sort of randomly working in this on stuff, that there's a profession and it's sort of a system behind what we're doing and that, that's enshrined in a code of ethics. And so we can say, you know, our ethics say we're interested in preservation, we're interested in access, we're interested in, you know, um, keeping things confidential that shouldn't be kept confidential, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's one of the major uses that I have for the archival code of ethics is when sort of this building of relationships 